Hey guys, Patricia here, and I just wanted to give a very special kind of vlog slash review slash discussion on the book Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age by Matthew Clickstein. Why? Well, very simple. A few days ago, it happened to have been one year since the book was published. And in honor of the upcoming event in October at the Hammerstein Ballroom, a night of Nickelodeon nostalgic nonsense, I thought to myself, you know, let me just look back on the book and see how well it holds up today. So, one of the first things that I really liked about the concept of this book was that... Unlike other books that it came out before, in which it was discussing about the economic perspective of Nickelodeon, and it was discussing about how Nickelodeon became a multi-billion dollar uh, mongol of a company that produces some of the most p popular cartoons out there, this one was very straightforward and simple. It got in a whole bunch of people who had worked on Nickelodeon from at least the very beginning, and they were able to talk about what their experience was with the network. A lot of people were a little disappointed about it because they thought it was going to be much more of a grander book discussing in intricate details about Nickelodeon's beginning, like all the way from the pinwheel era and stuff like that, but I never really found any complaints with this. I think that for the most part, unless you either grew up during the 70s or you are a true hardcore Nickelodeon fan, for the most part, I don't think that all the way toward the 70s and 80s, people are actually going to remember that part of Nickelodeon. The time period that people are associated with Nickelodeon are, of course, like the 80s and the 90s, especially the 90s. I'm glad it was able to keep focus on what people really wanted to read about. They wanted to know the behind the scenes of how things got started. Where did the logo come from? How did they come up with the interstitials? How did they think of the bumpers? And how did they perceive the idea of doing the doo-wop music. What was the inspiration behind all the people that we saw in the show and, and the concepts behind the show? What I really found interesting, and um, this is going to be spoilers by the way, so if you have not read the book, please, I would suggest that you go pick it up. It's on any single website that sells books, Amazon or uh, Barnes & Noble or anything like that. If you want to pick it up a digital copy, you can do that on your Nook or on your Kindle or whatever. There's an audiobook version of it. Just whatever that you can, please, you know, support the official release. I would highly recommend that you do that. When I was reading a lot in the early beginnings of the book, I noticed that they were discussing about how they wanted to find kids for their shows. And I'm talking about like real kids. It didn't matter what they looked like. It didn't matter how much they weighed. It didn't really matter if they had a lot of clothes or makeup or if they were rich or poor, whatever. They wanted to find the most imperfect child possible because they wanted it to relate to kids. And I just found that very interesting. You have to consider that back then, there wasn't a lot of union rules when it came to child actors. Uh, if you were in a low-budget television program, you know, and you had to shoot a program a couple of hours a week, mostly because that, you know, the kids had to go to school, they had to go home with, with their normal lives, with their families and stuff like that, so... It's not like today in which, you know, a kid was dedicated to being an actor or an actress. I mean, these were like regular kids. They went to school, they had friends, they had little part-time jobs, so... Being an actor or an actress wasn't their main priority. Neither was looking the part. I really like some of the quotes that the book was able to offer regarding about this topic. Uh, some of my favorites, of course, was Steve Slofkins, Marjorie Silkoff, Justin Cammy, and Alan Goodman. Some of these people, they discussed about what they were looking for for child actors or child actresses. None of them had to be perfect. In fact, imperfection was perfect for them. If you were to look at a TV show nowadays, all the kids would be absolutely 100% perfect. They have to be. Uh, kids have long, beautiful hair. They have perfect, shiny teeth. They have clear skin with little to no pimples or imperfections. They have the best up-to-date clothes. They have the up-to-date gadgets and all that stuff. They're already primmed, they're proper, th uh, because they have to be. 
they want to showcase to the real kids about, you know, this is the television world and you're living the real world. You know, for the most part, kids don't have perfect hair. Kids don't have perfect teeth. They don't have the up-to-date clothes. They don't have the up-to-date gadgets or whatever. Mostly because, you know, oh, this is television. You know, television's not real. But it was different back then. Take a look at You Can't Do That on Television and Salute Your Shorts, all that, all those previous shows that came out back then. You notice a lot of things. Like, the clothes were not fashionable. The the kids' hairs were unruly. Some of them had braces. Vanessa from You Can't Do That on Television was cross-eyed. They would never allow anybody to have a cross-eye in television nowadays. And also, actors such as Jason Simbler, Mike Morona, Danny Temporelli, they were redheads. How many redheads do you see on TV nowadays? So they were portraying kids like real kids because they were real kids. Okay, that's confusing. What I meant to say was is that they weren't actors. They weren't actresses. They didn't, you know, start off with doing, you know, McDonald's or Burger King commercials and then eventually lead up to being actors on TV shows or movies. Well, some of them did, but for the most part, most of them didn't. They just loved to act. They were called in to do what they like. And I think a lot of people were able to appreciate that because we were able to sit down, watch TV, watch You Can't Do That on Television, watch uh, Salute Your Shorts, watch Clarissa Explains It All, and we were able to see these characters and think to ourselves, wow, the way that Clarissa acted, that's me. Or the way that um, Budnick or Donkey Lips or Dina were portraying in the camp, that was me. I did that at one point. And that's why a lot of the shows that came out during the 80s and 90s, people still gravitate towards them because it was simple. It was relatable. It was able to kind of have that raw sense of emotion that, you know, was a bit risque for its time. A lot of shows, you know, that were gravitated towards children were not exactly, how I say, put into as much care and detail. You have to remember that back in the 80s, the majority of the shows that were being featured were cartoons. And the Saturday morning cartoons, well, they were basically just 30-minute toy commercials. Even somebody who was born and, for the most part, kind of grew up in the 80s, I even admit to this. Um, There's a reason why most people are not as nostalgic about the 80s as they are in the 90s now. Uh, The 90s was a revolutionary time, and... It did a lot of groundbreaking rules that, for the most part, is the norm, but back then, it was something never heard of. Another thing that I really liked about the book was that it discussed about the behind-the-scenes details uh, from all of our favorite shows from the uh, from Nickelodeon. Like, it talked very well in detail about where the music came from, and where slime came from, and... How did they come up with the idea of putting doo-wop music into their interstitials? Because you have to remember, doo-wop music was popular around the 50s. This was the 80s, the time of heavy rock and metal bands such as Twisted Sister and Poison. You know, a lot of uh, female singers like Madonna and Tiffany and all that stuff. I mean, where would they get the idea that kids from the 80s and 90s would gravitate towards music that was like three decades prior? Well... What I think that makes uh, the doo-wop music so captivating was that it said in the book about that kids were able to gravitate toward it. They didn't know why, but for some reason, they just really fell in love with it. And if you were to go to YouTube, if you were able to type in, like, you know, 90s Nickelodeon bumpers or anything like that, you would see that there are so many comments about how it brings them back to their childhood, about... You know, how the bumpers were simple yet classic, and how the music was so catchy and memorable. Um, For the most part, doo-wop music has always been like that. It was always kind of like the edge against, like, the prim, um, you know, kind of classic rock as opposed to the doo-wop music that was the 1950s. So... You know, going back to what I said previously about the child actors, um, it was raw and it was special. And I think that fit Nickelodeon to a T. You couldn't think of any other music that would fit into that. And I think that the current bumpers are trying to be like that, but they're missing one key element. They're missing the raw magic on what made it work the first time. I mean, sure, they can try, they can, you know, redo the doo-wop music, they can try to make the bumpers look nonsensical and idiosyncratic, but 
the magic is just lost. And the description about how the Splat logo came to be, about you know the decision from changing it to the pinball logo to the orange Splat logo and changing it into different varieties was such a really creative idea. Now, I vaguely knew about this story because um, Kevin and I interviewed Fred Siebert or Seibert. I still don't know how, we, how he's pronounced. I'll call him Siebert for now. So Kevin and I interviewed Fred um, about a few years ago on our blog, which you can check out. And he was describing about, you know, how the logo came to be, about how Tom Corey and a couple of other people, they came together and they decided to, you know, create the logo that was supposed to replace the pinball logo. And then they thought to themselves, what if we have an orange logo? Because, you know, if you were to put orange on television, it makes it pop out and, you know, changing the shape to whatever that you want it, it's able to give a lot more variety. They thought it was crazy at first, but for some reason it worked. Why did it work? Because, again, it was due to diversity and variety. You can make the logo into anything that you desired. You can make it into squiggly lines. You can make it into um, a spiky version of the Splat logo. You can make it into anything. Anything that you wanted. And that brought out the versatility. I mean, Nickelodeon was about that. It was about breaking ground and versatility. And the logo was able to match that perfectly. And the orange color, I mean, it really popped out. I mean, out of all the colors that you could have added in. I mean, Nickelodeon has had their fair share of colors. The very first logo was black and white. And then when they switched over to the pinball logo, the, it was all rainbow colored. I mean, orange was a huge standout compared to like your yellows and blues and reds. And that was what Nickelodeon was. It was a standout from everything else. It wasn't Disney. It wasn't NBC. It wasn't ABC. It wasn't CBS. It was Nickelodeon, and they wanted to show you it was Nickelodeon by popping out into the screen with a whole bunch of different shapes and designs and um, weird animations and stuff like that. And, and I think that's what make many people liked about it. It was, it was really fascinating, and it was. I mean, you never knew what those, you know, what was going to look like. Was it going to look like a um, big sheet? Was it going to look like a dog? Was it going to look like a bone? What was it going to look like? We didn't know, and we were excited about it. And then, unfortunately, around 2009. Uh, uh, Sima uh, Zargami, the current president of Nickelodeon, changed the logo because she felt it was outdated. And you know what? I don't really agree with that because you can change the logo into anything that you wanted. They kept the color, but they, they just changed the logo into like the regular Nickelodeon logo with a very bland font. There was no changes to it. It's like... It's kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. It kind of looks like a sheep, but under it is, you know, the wolf. It's trying to fool you into thinking that it's one of the pack. You know, they kept the orange logo because they want to show kids that, you know, it's still Nickelodeon. But by looking really close at it, it kind of isn't. I'll be just explaining a little bit more about that later on, but... Uh, let's move on to other things. I really liked the way that it was able to dedicate a chapter to the music. I love the music that was featured in um, Nickelodeon. I mean, as you already know, I do a music podcast, Nick Jukebox, where I feature some of the classic Nickelodeon songs. There's just something about the music that it makes it raw, it makes it zany, it makes it fun, it makes it goofy. Yet at the same time, you feel like there's a lot of passion into it. Whether it be the background music from the Ren and Stimpy show or, or Rugrats or Doug, or whether it be the soundtrack from The Adventures of Pete and Pete, or whether it be the intros to Double Dare or You Can't Do That on Television or Hey Dude or whatever. Whenever people discuss about Nickelodeon, they always discuss about the music. And yeah, the music is a huge standout. I think that with the music, you're able to have a diversity of what kind of music that you like. Uh, did you like pop music? Did you like rock music? Did you like country music? Did you like rap? It was all there. It was uh, Nickelodeon was able to have enough variety in which they can be able to gravitate to what kids liked in music form. And again, back to the variety and the diversity. Um, if you liked hip-hop, you go to all that. If you like indie rock, you go to Pete and Pete. If you liked a little bit of zany pop music, you go to Clarissa Explains It All. If you like country music, you go to Hey Dude. If you like the spooky, ambiance, creepy, atmospheric songs, you go over to Are You Afraid of the Dark? So, um, when you listen to some of the songs that played, it's just... I mean, not only does it 
put you in the right mood of what you're going to watch, but it's immediately iconic and recognizable. When you listen to a song, you think, wow, this is from Rugrats, or yeah, this is from Doug, or this is from All That, or this is from Pete and Pete. Oh, um, that song was from Clarissa, or that song was from uh, Salute Your Shorts. There's such a special charm about these songs that for the most part, are, is not exactly replicated nowadays. I mean, there are a couple of exceptions. Like, I love the soundtrack to Chalk Zone. It's one of my favorite soundtracks ever. And I also love the soundtrack for Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra. And I also love the background music for the new TMNT cartoon. And I do like a couple of the songs from Power Rangers Megaforce. But it's just not the same. It's, it's very different. It's not as raw or as simple as it was back then. It's very complex. They put in a lot of passion into it, of course, and that's why they're so memorable, but it's a different kind of charm that is not the same as what we get today. But unfortunately, all things must come to an end. Yep, you know what I'm talking about. The last chapter in the book. What many people consider to be the beginning of the end for Nickelodeon. Now, it's been debated on the subject. Like, a lot of people have their opinions on when Nickelodeon was dead to them. Uh, a lot of people who grew up in the 70s and 80s felt that the 90s was pretty much finished. It didn't gravitate toward the educational shows that made it so different than every other channel. The 90s kids will tell you that the 2000s were it pretty much died because a lot of their favorite shows were gone at this point, and they felt that the programs weren't as creative as the ones that came out previously. And the kids who grew up in the 2000s felt like today is when it's officially gone. The same reason as why the 90s kids felt that Nickelodeon was going downhill, but in a much more worse scenario. In my opinion, I think it's a little mixture of all of them. I do agree that I'm very less familiar with the 80s Nick more than any other time period, mostly because I was born in the late 80s, and a lot of the programs that I did watch were Eureka's Castle, David the Gnome, Double Dare, You Can't Do That on Television. I didn't watch all the other shows that came out in the 80s until um, just a few years ago when, I, when Kevin and I started doing the Nickelodeon tribute, but I was able to garner a much more bigger appreciation for those shows because they were the starting point. They were the, the programs that took Nickelodeon off. Sure, many people would consider them to be failures and not even worthy to be brought up in normal conversations compared to Doug, Rugrats, The Ren and Stimpy Show, Are You Afraid of the Dark, and all those programs, but they at least should be talked about just a tiny bit. Some of my favorite shows that came out in the 80s, I mean, they were just as influential as the stuff that came out in throughout the 90s. But I do admit that around the late 90s, when I was getting to be a teenager, I did notice, like, things were a bit different. I did notice that around the late 90s, when I was becoming a teenager, that Nickelodeon started to become a little bit different. Like, for example, when Rugrats came back in 97, I was super excited because I was a fan of the original Rugrats that came out in 91 through 93. So I wanted to watch the new episodes, and then I felt that it was different. The animation was different, the, um, the tone was different, and the colors were different, and the, the personalities were tweaked to be more child-friendly. I talk about this a ton of times on Nickelodeon Slimecast podcast, but even as a kid, when the, the episodes came back, I felt that it was just different. I, it didn't click on me like it did with the earlier seasons. I mean, with the exception of maybe Rugrats in Paris the movie and a handful of episodes here and there, I just didn't like the revival of Rugrats. And there was just something about the original run of Rugrats that made me love it even more. I don't know if it was the pop culture references or the way that the characters were treated a little bit more seriously or that the storylines were simple. I don't know, but... I felt that there was something really different when Rugrats came back from its hiatus. The same thing with Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yes, I'm well aware that, you know, it came out around 97 and it tried to capitalize on the popularity of Goosebumps, which, you know, that was becoming a really popular anthology series and the show came out around the same time. But it was different. I mean, the characters, well, the characters for the most part, I didn't really care for them. But then again, I, most, I for the most part, didn't really care about the original characters either. It was just the tone of the stories. It just didn't feel right. Something about it just felt a little off. Like, it wasn't as, um, it wasn't as raw and edgy as it once was. And you rarely saw Sardo and Dr. Vink. I mean, those were like some of my favorite 
recurring characters in the show. I mean, I would have loved to have seen more of them. Not to mention that there was a lot of other shows that came out that I didn't really care too much about. When doing the Nickelodeon tribute, I kind of appreciated all the stuff that came out in the late 80s and early 90s. But as for the late 90s, I didn't really have anything decent to say about them, especially the live action shows. I mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. With the exception of all that Keenan and Kel and the Amanda show, all of which were basically compilations of programs done by Dan Schneider, Mike Tomlin, and Brian Robbins, every single live action show sucked. You know, Animorphs the TV series was an abomination to the books. 100 Days Freddy McDowell is boring and bland. Shelby Wu was completely overshadowed by Keenan and Kel. And then there's Cousin Skeeter. Uh, for those who have been with me for a while, you already know how I feel about Cousin Skeeter. And also the game shows. The game shows also kind of fell, you know, flat around the late 90s. Growing up as a kid, I would watch marathons of Double Dare, Nick Arcade, Nickelodeon Guts, and Legends of the Hidden Temple. I mean, I fell in love with those games because they were just so cool and they were so action-packed and extreme. It, it was like a showcase of what the 90s was, and it was always a lot of fun to look back on. Well, except for Nick Arcade, which, you know, for the most part, a lot of the kids didn't know what they were doing with the games, especially the girls. I mean, <laughs> I mean, oh man, <laughs> I would have wished that maybe I would have joined Nick Arcade when I was young because I would have showed them how a girl gamer is. <laughs> anyway, but beside the point, around the late 90s, um, Figure It Out and You're On were kind of like the beginning of the end of game shows for me. I already discussed numerous times about that. I, don't, I didn't really care about the original Figure It Out. The contestants, all they did was just sit next to the host and they pretty much did nothing. And then when they showcased their talents, they were for the most part stupid. Like, you know, the girl who had the smelliest sneakers and the kid who collected toe jam and a kid who can eat um, a slice of American cheese and shape it like the United States and, uh, and not to mention the kid who could eat the most watermelon in a minute. Oh god, that was embarrassing and stupid. And then there was Euron. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna even mention too much about that. But, you know, beside the point, I, I'm, I felt that around the late 90s, Nickelodeon was kind of drifting away in a completely different direction. And for the most part, the people who had worked on it even agreed just the same. A lot of them left around that time period, especially Geraldine Laybourne, the first president of Nickelodeon, went off to do the Disney Channel. And you can see that the Disney Channel kind of upped the quality around the late 90s. Especially, you know, you had Paul Germain and Joe Aslamby here creating Recess and Lloyd in Space. Jim Jenkins did Disney's Doug, even though most people actually hated it. Uh, you had shows like Fillmore and The Weekenders. You had um, Pepper Ann. You had all these great shows that came out around the Disney Channel. And for the most part, all of those shows were done by people who formerly worked on Nickelodeon. They wanted to showcase their creativity and freedom again. But Nickelodeon was just going in a different direction that, for the most part, was more business-oriented. And it's kind of that way today. Uh, I recently posted an article about how Nickelodeon is dropping in ratings, mostly because that they're not as groundbreaking and influential as they once were. They're playing it way too safe. Um, they're, they're kind of looking like the Disney Channel. And when they first started, they wanted to be distant from Disney. They wanted to be the anti-Disney. They wanted to be raw. They wanted to be different. They wanted to be special. They wanted to be relatable. And now it's like what DJ McHale said. It essentially became Disney Lodian. And that's kind of sad because, I mean, you went to Nickelodeon to see the relatable characters, to see the wacky, idiosyncratic situations, and you went there to see the fun, quirky, simple plots and stuff like that. And um, for the most part, it just isn't that way anymore. There, are, what um, another thing that I noticed was that it used to gravitate both for the kids and for the adults. They used to have jokes that only the adults get, but the kids wouldn't understand. And then the kids would watch, you know, the slime, or they would watch the characters do funny things. It was able to become enjoyable. They brought the whole family together. They were able to enjoy themselves. It was able to have a huge, diverse fan base. But unfortunately, Nickelodeon nowadays is just focusing on the kids and nobody else. Adults, when they see the programs that are on nowadays, they absolutely hate it. And the only show that is gravitating towards them is Spongebob. And of course, TMNT, because, you know, TMNT has been around since the 80s, and 
TMNT, the new incarnation, is really fantastic and is done by somebody who is a huge fan of the original. And I guess you could also say Legend of Korra as well, um, even though that it gravitates towards kids and adults in a different way, but you get what I'm saying. Um, when reading the book Slimed all over again, I just appreciated about how much passion and work that Matthew was able to put into this because it was not easy whatsoever, I can assure you. Uh, doing the Nickelodeon tribute with um, Kevin, we were able to realize about how hard it was. I mean, rewatching the shows that we loved uh, when we were kids, watching shows that we have never seen before, trying to find interesting facts about... Um, a show or a character that nobody knew about uh, trying to get as much interviews as we can it's been hard it's been really hard and it's been really really time consuming even though that we don't have a huge fan base we do have a couple of people come by and say that they really liked our Nickelodeon stuff and that really means a lot to us I, and for Matthew for those who grew up in you know the 80s and 90s are able to say that they loved his work and even for kids who didn't grow up during this time period loved Matthew's book it was informative and they were able to know that you know at one time Nickelodeon wasn't all about the sponge you know fr uh, friends of mine such as Gabe Marsh from the reopen Nickelodeon studios in Orlando Florida Facebook page he's in his early teens and he never grew up with this uh, with these shows Yet at the same time we talk about these programs all the time like if they were new mostly because it's timeless it's able to become relevant to the kids of today. There's something about its charm that kids who never grew up during this time period can be able to appreciate as opposed to the shows that are going on today. Uh, you can be able to look back fondly on shows such as Doug, Rugrats, or Ren and Stimpy as opposed to programs such as Breadwinners and Sanjay and Craig. And there was a quote from my good friend, uh, The Second Opinion from Manic Expression when I was posting the article about that Nickelodeon's ratings were dropping at its lowest. And I really liked the way he said that even though that Nickelodeon wasn't um, the number one channel that he used to go to as a kid, he went there because it was different than Disney and Cartoon Network. He felt that it was simpler, it was raw, it was special, it was relatable, and he was able to appreciate that, but now the magic is gone. The magic is gone because the people who did that magic are gone and they moved on to other things. And, you know, Nickelodeon is essentially the wolf in sheep's clothing. They want to fool people into thinking that they're the same channel that they once were. But deep down inside, they care about the money. They care about the marketing. They care about the promotional stuff. And for a lot of people in Nickelodeon, from what I've been reading in the book, Slimed, they don't seem to remember their roots. Maybe for those who are working in Nickelodeon now, maybe they don't know about uh, Clarissa Explains It All or What Would You Do or Double Dare or anything like that. It's kind of crazy to say the least. They care about the now. They care about what's cool. And with that mentality, they're just going to become really dated. And in my opinion, that's pretty sad. With Matthew's dedication of getting all these people into this book, it really just showcases that he has the spirit of Nickelodeon. It may be simple, it may not have a lot of pretty pictures, it may not discuss about all the shows that came out around the 80s and 90s, but is able to have a unique charm that people can go back to all over again to read off all the little quotes that they missed the first time, or to um, read about a fun fact that they never knew about, or to read more in detail about a show that they used to watch all the time. If you're a hardcore Nickelodeon fan, I would highly recommend that you get this book. It's still a fantastic read, and if you haven't bought it already, then go out and buy it now. What are you waiting for? Don't wait for me. Go, go get it. Thank you so much for listening to this. Um, if you have any uh, comments about the book or if you have any favorite quotes that you liked from Slimed that you want to post about or if you have any Nickelodeon memories that you want to share, post on in the comments below. And coming up soon for our channel is going to be a lot of things. We're going to be doing a special thank you video slash Q&A in honor of us getting 200 subscribers. And uh, I'm having a special guest over discussing about the secret world of Alex Mack since it will be celebrating his 20th anniversary. Also, Kevin and I will be having um, a group panel with our friends at Manic Expression discussing about Ah Real Monsters for its 20th anniversary. Kevin and I will be having a first duo interview where we'll be interviewing not one, but two people. Oh, and last but not least, we will be having a very special episode of Turtle Talk discussing about all the things that we missed out over the past couple of months. So stay tuned for that. So yeah, until then, this has been Patricia. I uh, hope to see you soon. Take care.